This is Writing Lessons, and I'm your host, Silas House. In each episode of Writing Lessons, we look at a different topic of creative writing. Today, we're discussing writing for children and the deliciousness of words. Our guest today is a treasure of American literature. George Ella Lyon was born in Harlan County, Kentucky, and served as Kentucky's Poet Laureate in 2015 and 16. She is the award-winning author of many acclaimed books, including picture books, poetry collections, novels, novels for children, and more. On a personal note, I must tell you that George Ella was also one of the earliest established writers to encourage me as a writer myself, and for that, I am forever grateful. Many other writers will tell you that she is one of the people who first influenced and inspired them. She lives in Lexington. Well, George Ella, I think of you primarily as a poet, but you've written so much for children. So when I thought about doing a show for picture books, I thought, I'm going to go straight to the expert. Everybody seems to think they can write a book for children. They think that for some reason that's the easiest kind of writing. I would argue that it's one of the more difficult kinds of writing. What do you say to that? Well, um, I usually say at the beginning of a picture book workshop or a writing for children workshop that you've got to get assumptions out of the way. One of them is that it's easy. Another one is that it won't require much of you emotionally. You can keep your distance, which kills any writing, of course. Mm-hmm. And the other one is you'll make a lot of money. Right. So if you can get over that, we can go on. Uh-huh. Uh, people, I think when people think it's easy, they they think the number of words mm-hmm. and not realizing that it, it's harder to be brief, for one thing. Mm-hmm. And those words have to do so much. I don't think they have a real respect for children. Paula Fox, a writer for children, said children are not a race of heart, but ourselves when new. And it's that newness, that that wonder that they bring, that's so uh, that gives us life. It so mm-hmm. takes us back to what's essential. And they ask the real questions right. uh, that we sometimes just pretend we have answers for, or we don't have answers, so we just go on and do what we're doing. You know, the mm-hmm. children get to the heart of things, and so they require they require your full your full heart and all you artistry you can bring to it. Right. You can't fool them. No. And you better not preach to them right. or think you're going to set them straight because mm-hmm. that's deadly. Uh, also, just because you you make up stories for your grandchildren doesn't mean that they're going to work as books. I think a lot of people think that writing is easy because telling stories is a part of our everyday life. But Writing is very different than just telling a story, and it requires a craft being really honed and studied and years and years of work. Yeah. Yeah, and you have to have uh, Olympic patience. Mm -hmm. (laughs) For sure. And you have to be stubborn, Mm -hmm. you know, because of the rejection you're going to go through and because a lot of projects just don't work out. Yeah. You come to find out. It isn't a picture book after all. It might be an essay or something else, mm-hmm. but it's not a picture book. And when you do the dummy, uh, which is the the mock-up mm-hmm. of where the pages turn, many times you that's when you realize it's not a picture book. The page turns don't do a thing for it. Right. Maybe it's a poem, but it's, it's yes. not a picture book. So... Uh, and you just have to read a lot. I mean, people will tell me they want to write for children, and I ask, what books do you read? And yes. they don't. Or they say, where the wild things are, mm-hmm. you know, which is a great book, but... It's um, not the only book. It's not the only book. <laughs> and, you know, you need to you need to read wild, widely and wildly mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and, and study. What is the most important element of writing a book for children, whether that be picture book, middle grade novel, young adult novel, whatever? I think it's the voice. Hmm. And the voice, you know, it might be the voice of a character, but it might not. But it's the voice that comes in at the level of the child's world. And 
And I feel like I have sort of an inner four or five-year-old and an inner 13 or 14-year-old. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and that, you know, I can call on that. Not that the characters are me. I don't mean that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and, and I listen. I listen to children all the time. I mean, I have, I've written down things from school visits. I've written down things from my own kids. Uh, it's so wonderful to find these glimpses into my boy's childhood mm-hmm. when I when I have in my journal these things. So the listening to the voices of children, mm-hmm. but yeah, I would say it's the voice. It's the voice with any piece of writing. Yeah, absolutely. That's where you struggle and struggle and struggle, and then suddenly, if it's going to be there, it's there, right. and then you may have tons of writing yet to do, but you you have the the traction and the momentum because that voice is going to lead you mm-hmm. where you need to go and where it wants to go. Uh, so you have to trust that. Uh, you can't force it. Yeah, I would say voice is the key to all writing. Robert Morgan was an early teacher of mine, a great writer, a great person. And he told me once that it's not so much about the story you're telling as it's about how you're telling the story. And that has always stuck with me. And, you know, it's such a simple thing, but it really shapes the, the way that you think about a piece of writing once you repeat that to yourself. Right, right. And it's it's a gift when you get there, but you had to go the road. Mm-hmm, exactly. Right, it's like those, they sound really simple when they're said aloud, but they're it's really complex figuring out how to do it. It's almost yeah. like it's easier said than done. Oh, right? and, and you have to have, I always feel with any piece of writing, the moment that I, the moment I'm waiting for is when it has something I couldn't give it. Mm. That's where the magic that's is. That's where the magic is. Yep. And that's where the voice is when it, you know, I've, it's like all you can do for your garden, but you can't make beans. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I tell my students all the time that when, when it becomes organic is when you know you're on the right path. Yeah. When things just start popping up. So I love that that you've used the garden because that's exactly what yeah. it's like. Yeah. Well, let's talk about picture books specifically. You mentioned creating a dummy for a picture book. So if you, if, maybe if you talk a little bit more about that. But what are the key elements of a picture book? Well, you know, as I was saying, um, the emotion, the voice. Mm-hmm the deliciousness of the words mm. um, and the way they harmonize because because children are enchanted by that and uh, it's a big step to reading when children start saying the words of a book and turning the pages mm-hmm. because they are they've gotten that story shape into themselves and it's partly because the words are have so many sound connections and rhythm connections that they're easy to internalize. And so the sound, the rhythm, the emotional trajectory, uh, and, and most picture books are 32 to 48 page, 40 or 48 pages long. Mm-hmm. And so I compare it to tap dancing in a telephone booth. Hmm. You know, just hope it doesn't ring. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you don't have much. You don't have much space. You don't have much time. So you have to be as distilled uh, as you can, and you have to make the pages. You know, you have to make the pages turn. So there's a whole lot to choreograph. My uh, the editor I work with most used to say it can be like a little play, mm-hmm. and if you think about that. Uh, if you think about it that way, how it goes along a flow of pages, where the height of it is, where the turn is, mm-hmm. you know, you can sometimes strengthen that by by changing what's on what's page, what's on what is on what page. Uh-huh. Um, and for me, uh, the dummy's really helpful for that because it's just the same number of pages. With if it's thirty two, you know, you take. Uh, eight pages and fold them and staple them and then you've got 32 pages and 
I use post-it notes for the words, and that way, if it's on the wrong page, I mm. can move it easily. Yeah, uh, it just makes me more. Uh, it makes it. It makes it makes me more flexible, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's helpful in the process. Plus, if I erase a lot. It makes me think of when I was little and I'd erase through the page and then I'd cry and you know, all <laughs> that. So I don't want to do that. But I do read it aloud yes. and turn the pages. Uh, I mean, I read everything aloud. Me too. Because, again, the music is, and I can tell when I'm faking it. I can tell mm -hmm. when the energy dropped yeah. or, you know, we were going along on parquet and here's some plywood. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that you said made me think about how psychological the act of writing must be. You must think about things that maybe the reader isn't thinking about when they're reading it, but something registers somewhere in their brain, even if they're not thinking about it. For instance, the way that we use white space or where to turn the page and things like that, right, are really right. important. Right, right. And it's, you know, it's also sound and, and rhythm and voice are in your body. So you're not mm -hmm. just responding with your brain. And uh, I have taken videos of my grandchildren as they're coming along in their relationship with books. Mm -hmm. And uh, Julian, who's almost a year old, his mom was reading him Goodnight Moon. And he kisses the page. Oh, God. I mean, just about... <laughs> That's a That'll melt your heart. Yeah. yeah, but this is how this is how the magic happens, you know. Um, and and the reaction to books, the trying to get into books. I heard about a little boy who his mom found him in the morning. He was a toddler. He had uh, taken off his PJs, taken off his diaper, opened the night moon, and he was standing on it as if he could get in there. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So you know that. The depth of the reality, the depth of attention a child brings to the picture book, it has to be worthy. Mm -hmm. You know, you're in relationship with this this reader. This is important stuff. It's really yes. important. You mentioned having an inner child, an inner teenager, etc. So maybe that's part of the answer to this, but I'm just wondering, when you're writing novels for young readers, uh, whether it's young adult or middle grade, how do you strike the balance of not condescending to them, but also not writing in a way that is too adult or that goes over their head? Again, I think, you know, I think it's the voice and the the depth of the character um, is in is in. I mean, they are intensely becoming mm -hmm. from you know from day one or from the womb. They're intensely becoming. And they are questioning, and to go back to that questioning place, and where they're envisioning what could be, because they haven't, you know, they're not, they're not separate yet from the, mm -hmm. the child world or their parental world, and um, to enter into that, well, it's the difference between being inside and being outside, because when you're out, you have to be outside to condescend, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Unless there's some psychological condition I don't know about, but but you have to be in, and if you're really in there, the the character is gonna end is gonna carry who the reader will be. Mm -hmm. Not that I think middle grade and young adult books are just for readers those ages. Some of them are for the best of them. I think are for everybody. Right. And picture books as well. Yeah. I, I mean, I still love to read Charlotte's Web, for oh, instance. It's one of my all-time favorites. Oh, I know. But, you know, so many books. Yeah, yeah. Like and there are amazing, amazing writers out there. And now we have the graphic novel, which is just, mm -hmm. you know, wide, widespread. Uh, and I think, I think a, you know, a great new way in how widespread it is and how many mm -hmm. people are, and how many directions they, they go in. It's a, it's a like discovering a new uh, whole new system in a cave. You mm. know. What are some picture books that would be good for aspiring picture book writers to look at? Two of my favorites are, and they're very different. One is called All the World, 
it's a it, it rhymes. It's a poem, mm -hmm. and of course they can be poems and not rhyme, but this one does rhyme. Uh, but it goes through the day so incredibly with this one family, but they're part of a whole community on this little island, and it goes from the at the beach in the morning, and it and it takes you through the farmer's market and the playing at a tree and being getting caught in this huge rainstorm and going in a restaurant, a diner. But all the people, he it accumulates with the people they see at the farmer's market, then they're in some of the next. And at the end, they're all in a, uh, it's evening and they're all gathered in this house on the, like the point of the island and they're playing music and they're all ages and all, you know, all genres and genders and colors. Mm -hmm. And it's just this celebration of, of, uh, of community and, uh, and the wonders of the world. So I, that's one, I think, especially because the, the illustrations, you can see how the poem, the text is dis, is opened up. So in such an extraordinary way by mm -hmm. those right. illustrations. Um, and then there's a, a book by Patrick McDonald, and he is both the illustrator and the writer, and it's it's called Me Jane, and mm. it's about Jane Goodall mm. as a little girl. Oh, look for her. And there's no parents in it. There's no siblings. There's no where she was born. It's just about her and her relationship to the natural mm. world, and it's so spare and... Uh, and the turn, the page turn at the very end, took my breath away. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but and it even has uh, a double spread, which is from her childhood notebook. Mm. Her note, her nature. Oh, notes. I got to get that. Yeah, you got to. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you have mentioned the phrase "the page turn" mm -hmm. several times. Would you say that that's sort of akin to the? Uh, to enjambment in poetry, you know, whereas like enjambment can be the end of the line keeps going, so it keep it leads your eye on. That's one thing that enjambment is. But another thing enjambment can be is that it can change the meaning. Like the line can be, you think the line means one thing, then when you keep reading, it means something else. Yes. So is the page turn similar to enjambment? Do it you can, think it can it can work that way? Uh, it can also. You can be very surprised when you turn the page. You can be, it can be a quiet shift. It can be something really dramatic that changes. It can be, you can come to a full stop too, sometimes mm -hmm. at the end. And then, but what you can't do is start over. You know, it, it has to keep, it, the narrative has to keep moving. We don't have time. Now you may get, you may get, Sometimes a wordless spread in the middle of a picture mm -hmm. book, and uh, and that's you know that's just right for that book. And sometimes the illustrator decides that the writer exactly. doesn't decide that. Right. Um, but the page turns can speed it up; they can slow it down, and so can line, you know, the way the line is moving in a poem. Right. So you can just study the way that's done in different. Picture books, and I wanted to say that there are picture books from much older kids too. Uh, you know, there's a book called uh, "The Little Ships" for uh, I'd say fourth and fifth graders about uh, it's by Louise Borden, and it's about the evacuation of Dunkirk, mm. and she tells it from the point of view of a child who she imagines went over with mm. with her in dad one in one of the little ships, wow. and researching that if you think. If you think it's, you know, you don't have to go to any trouble to write a picture book. She found a man who had been one of the soldiers. She mm -hmm. wrote to him. She went to England and interviewed him. Wow. She crossed the channel in one of the little boats with him mm -hmm. on the anniversary. And had she gotten in, had she, get, had she gotten paid for this? No. Wow. No, she was out on a limb. Mm -hmm. And um, You do what you have to do for the book. You do. You follow it, mm -hmm. and um, it's extraordinary. This, this book illustrated by Michael Foreman. Just for the benefit of, of anybody who's you know thinking about writing picture books and trying to learn more, I think it's important for us to point out that 
most of the time the writer does not get to pick the illustrator. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, people think, and people think you get to tell the illustrator what to right. do. Mm -hmm. Well, nobody told you what to do, and it's not your business. Mm -hmm. Your business is the words on the page. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what your grandmother looked like. And has the illustrator has his or her own vision. And that's one of the, you have to let go. Yeah, it's a collaboration. It is a collaboration, mm -hmm. but very odd because you may have never met, right. you may never meet. And it's the editor who communicates with both of you. Mm -hmm. And the editor is the spine of the book in that sense. You used a phrase earlier that I just loved, the deliciousness of the words. And so, I mean, when I think about your writing, one thing I think about is your fantastical way of using language, the unexpected, the sensory, the interesting, you know, I just think you think about language in a very specific way, right? And when I think about my favorite writers, I think that a lot of time I could maybe read their writing and know who they were because of their, you know, their certain style and their the way they approach language. How do you foster that? Do you know how do you bit, make that work better so that it's, you know, so that it becomes organic for you as a writer? Well, you ask beautiful questions. <laughs> I think, I, I'm so glad you said that about the senses because I should have said that in talking about picture books that the sensory is so important. I mean, that's what brings something alive. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and children are, you know, they're alive to their toes. Right. And, uh, and, and they don't, they don't, they don't, things haven't been compartmentalized and, uh, you know, my son was sitting on the floor when he was, I don't know, maybe three, and he stood up and he fell down, and he, said he didn't know what happened. And I said, oh, your foot's asleep. And he said, no, I've got stars in my shoe. <laughs> and that's exactly how it feels. And that's so much better. <laughs> yes. So he didn't uh, need my old <laughs> handed down saying he had his own. Right. And so, you know, again, that, that refreshment, that, wonder and I think I think because well I, I grew up with good talkers mm -hmm. and storytellers right. and I had you know of course the King James mm -hmm. and hymns and I was read to and uh, and I and especially because my daddy read poetry to me and I just thought well that's it mm -hmm. that's it yes something in my own you know, my own soul responded to that, the intensity of the language, the melodies, the drama. Right. Uh, and these weren't poems for kids. Mm -hmm. And so he once said to me, I think you must feel about words the way I feel about numbers. Mm. And I felt so seen. Mm. You know, what? Right. I, I mean, I was grown then, but, um, right. or what passes for grown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I th I think metaphorically I I you know I just do and I you know I think I think I came with that but when I when I was revising Borrowed Children the first novel I did for kids it would be a middle grade um, but the last thing I had to do was go through with a metaphor rake and take some of them out mm. because mm -hmm. it yes. it can get to be too right. much and uh, and sometimes it's a it, like any any technique of writing or any aspect of writing, it can become reflexive, mm -hmm. and then it's got to go because it's subtracting from the work of the work. Yeah, I think you know one of the best writing lessons we can give aspiring writers is to encourage them to revise more. More and more, I, I talk to people who seem to think you, you just you sit down and it all pours out of you and you print it out and send it off and it gets published. And as a young writer, I think that I probably, revision was probably 10% of my process and now it's probably 90% oh, of my yeah. process. Yeah, people do not want to hear that. Yeah. It, they just don't have any idea. But I think once you see how it <laughs> makes your writing bloom, you can come to love it. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah, because, and there's this wonderful book uh, called Art and Fear 
the perils and joys of art making. Mm. You know, they say that they're photographers, but that it creating happens between you and the thing you're creating, between the creator and the thing, mm-hmm. and you have to let it speak back to you. Yes. And so part of the joy of revision is you get to listen more you know, because you're not mm-hmm. in that first draft falling in love sort of state. And, and I think that is so, that can be so intoxicating. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I used to say that first drafts are like falling in love and second drafts are like marriage. You know, from then on, you've got to work on this stuff. <laughs> you know, it's not just, <gasps> uh, there's there's life to be worked out. And, but you learn. What's the best writing lesson you've ever learned that you can articulate for our listeners in just a couple of minutes? Well, I, I was doing a workshop with fifth graders in Boyd County. And I was doing this Where I'm From exercise, which mm-hmm. is a poem that uh, basically a list of experiences you're from. And this boy said, I'm from baseball. So I said, do you, do you play or do you just watch? He said, oh, I play. And I said, what position? He said, I'm the catcher. And I said, oh, gosh, I don't think I could stand that mask over my face. And he said, oh, I even like it when the sweat gets in my eyes. Mm-hmm. I said, so, okay, put that in. And the line he came up with is, I'm from the sweat behind the catcher's mask. Oh, that's great. And I said, wow. He said, oh, I get it. You don't want me to tell you about it. You want me to put you there. I said, yeah, I knew I came here to learn something. <laughs> but that's it. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's the miracle when it happens. And that's why we read, too, isn't mm-hmm. it? I mean, we read for information, obviously, and we... And we read to learn to think better. But we want to be there. Mm-hmm. We want to have yes. this other experience. We want our lives to be wider and deeper. And so just put us there. Just put us there. Writing Lessons is an initiative of the 2024-2025 Kentucky Poet Laureate. That's me, Silas House. I'm thankful for the support of the Kentucky Arts Council, the Carnegie Center for Literacy and Learning, the Office of Governor Andy Bashir, and Kentucky Humanities. This show is written, recorded, edited, and produced by me. I hope you will share the show with other writers, students, or anyone who is interested in the creative process. Please subscribe to our show, and if you like it, I hope you'll leave a review or a five-star rating. That'll help us get the show to more listeners. Thanks so much for listening to Writing Lessons.